So hello and welcome to our latest employment law webinar. I'm Angie Crush, I'm a partner here in the employment law team and today I'm joined by my colleagues Meredith Hurst, Julie Goodwin Hi. and hello. Jonathan Mansfield. Hello. Now obviously Thomas Mansfield specialise in employment law but we also have a few other departments uh, which are family, litigation and private client law as well. Here in the employment team, we work with HR managers and HR teams and also business owners where they don't have an HR function. Now, today's webinar is going to be a little bit different to the usual format in that rather than having one theme, um, we're going to talk about some of the notable cases from the year, both reported ones as well as from our personal experience. Um, where we feel they might have sort of practical value to you. We're discussing some COVID cases, redundancy appeals, worker status, vaccine, GDPR, um, and a few other bits as well. But we don't just want to talk to you uh, for an hour and talk at you. So please try and make it as interactive as possible by asking questions. There's a chat box where you can put questions and we'll just answer those. You know, they don't need to be on any particular topic, albeit they do need to be employment law related. Um, but put your questions there. I think a, a couple of people have already sent questions in. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, and we'll, we'll try and work through them. Um, we also thought while um, it's approaching the Christmas season, if you've got any funny Christmas party stories, um, pop those in the chat box and, and we'll read out the best ones at the end. Um, I've seen lots of funny Christmas party stories ranging from people setting the table on fire when they tripped up with flaming Zambukas um, to hitting their boss on the plate with a um, a plate in a Greek restaurant, not realising that there were actually special plates that you were supposed to do this with. Um, so do give us all a laugh by putting your uh, funny Christmas party stories in the chat box. And then before we start with the substantive uh, information, um, there was just one thing that we wanted your help with. So Thomas Mansfield, like many other businesses, we've been venturing back to the office and we're looking to set up an employment law club um, somewhere sort of HR professionals can gather informally, um, sort of just get around the table, maybe once a quarter and have some sort of roundtable discussions facilitated by a couple of our team um, on sort of topics that are of interest and concern and sort of uh, particularly pressing at the time. Ideally, we wanted to do this in person at our London office, which is just near Bank Station. Um, but we wanted to canvas your views. Um, so please, can you, rather than do a poll on it, can you just pop in the chat box now whether you'd be interested in in-person forums um, or whether you'd only consider virtual at the moment? Um, it'd probably be at some point, you know, spring next year that the first one happened. So um, can you just put that in there to help us in planning what we think is the best way forward? Um, if you'd like person, if you want in person or virtual, if actually you'd like to, to do something like that, it'll be much smaller groups um, so that you know people can sort of share their experiences and stuff. So thank you for doing that. So I will move on. Um, and Jonathan, it wouldn't be a 2021 web webinar update without a look at some COVID cases. So can you tell us what's been happening with the COVID cases? Yeah, sure. It will not be a surprise to you that the pandemic has thrown up a significant number of employment tribunal claims. Uh, a substantial chunk of these have related to the furlough scheme, so it's to be hoped that they'll have less relevance in the future. However, it's also put a spotlight on some important areas of existing law. Um, I should say that the recency of this case, these cases means that most of them are at only employment tribunal level, but we don't have many appeal cases yet, which means that they're not binding on other tribunals, although they will, they do illustrate the way the tribunal is approaching a number of these uh, matters. Now, it's inevitably the case that um, where employers are put under pressure, as they were in the uh, pandemic, that the, the are risks of making mistakes which can lead to expensive employment tribunals. And the first case I'm going to mention 
uh, is a good illustration of this. It's the case of Brian and Landmark Support Services Limited. Uh, this is a case where the employer provided um, project management services for military locations um, for the Ministry of Defence. Um, and early on in the pandemic, their operations were confirmed to be essential services and the employees were deemed to be key workers. The claimant was the only project management coordinator at one of the sites and the employer considered her presence to be crucial. Uh, but she was unable to send her son to school. Um, this was for a couple of reasons. She was suffering from asthma um, and later on because the, um, the school was at capacity. So she requested to work from home and then was disciplined for refusing to attend the workplace. She resigned in response to this and claimed constructive dismissal as well as indirect uh, sex discrimination. Now, the, in, in this case, the sex discrimination claim was up, upheld. Um, first of all, it was uh, stated that um, or found that she was subjected to a provision criterion or practice in the form of the requirement to work on site during normal working days. Um, whenever an employee was ordered to attend and then by taking disciplinary action against an employee who did not comply with that requirement. Now, as in, is typical in the case of um, indirect discrimination cases, the tribunal accepted that women have greater child care responsibilities than men and there was a specific disadvantage to the individual in this case. Also, there is as in all indirect discrimination cases, a defence available where the employer can show that their actions are a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Now, while it was deemed to be legitimate here, uh, they had good business uh, reasons for her wanting, to, wanting her to attend, um, they found that it was not proportionate in the circumstances given the particular circumstances of the claimant. She was unable to get uh, childcare and couldn't send her child uh, to, to, to school in these unprecedentedly abnormal times. It was commented that they could have allowed her some time off, they could have set some realistic targets and negotiated a long-term solution. Instead, in refusing the request to work, for, work from home outright and instigating these disciplinary proceedings, they had fallen. Um, foul of the law. Um, now, as we warned uh, in our earlier webinars from the, in the earlier on in the pandemic, th there were bound to be cases coming through relating to the health and safety protections. And in particular, there are a number of specific protections in the Employment Rights Act uh, for employees who raise issues relating to health and safety. Um, this came up in the case of Rendina and Royston Veterinary Care Limited. This is a case where the claimant worked for a particularly, uh, I have to say, imbecilic employer, where the practice director kept repeating the opinion, which was popular in certain tabloids and even among politicians at the time, if you remember, that the COVID-19 was like cold, flu and being overhyped. Ms Rendina, who had family in Italy and suffered from asthma, was acutely aware of the devastation the pandemic had already caused uh, in Italy. If you, and if you remember, they went into a nationwide lockdown several weeks uh, before we did over here. The one concession made to her by the, this practice director was that she was allowed to wear a mask in the surgery, but only if she explained to clients that this was because she was vulnerable. Even after the first lockdown was announced by the Prime Minister, the practice director sent a text message to staff stating that the practice would open as normal the following day. The claimant attended work that day, but she avoided uh, attending procedures that she viewed as non-essential. She also expressed her concern about the lack of adequate measures in place to prevent the spread of COVID in the practice, and uh, also circulated an email referring to recommendations from the uh, British Veterinary Associations which were not being followed. On the 30th of March 2020, Ms Rendina was dismissed at the end of her shift with the practice manager stating that there was a level of discord between them that made her position untenable. 
Not surprisingly, the Employment Tribunal found that Ms Rendina was automatically unfairly dismissed. And remember, automatic unfair dismissals of, of, of any kind don't require the two years uh, qualifying service. And it was found that she had conveyed her health and safety concerns regarding perceived inadequate arrangements by the practice to avoid the spread of COVID-19 in a reasonable way uh, by way of a reasonably worded email and by speaking in a reasonable and polite way to the practice director. She also raised her concerns in a measured way in two practice uh, meetings and uh, raised the idea of a serious and imminent danger from the spread of COVID. The Employment Tribunal found that the reason for the unfairness here was because she brought to the attention by reasonable means circumstances connected with work which she reasonably believed were harmful or potentially harmful to health and safe health or safety which reflects the statutory protection that was relevant here. Thanks Jonathan so those ones not so good for employers albeit you know deservedly so. Are you able to tell us about any cases which were better news for the employer? Yes I can um, an instructive case which did go in favour of the employer is that of Rogers and Leeds uh, Laser Cutting uh, Limited. This is a case where the claimant messaged his manager to say that he will be staying away from his workplace until the lockdown eased. He was worried about infecting his vulnerable children. Uh, he had a, ba a baby and a child who had sickle cell anemia um, with, the, with the virus. Um, and um, he, he raised um, a, a claim uh, under the legislation which states that in circumstances of danger which an employee reasonably believes to be serious and imminent and which could not reasonably have, have been expected to avert, he left or proposed to leave or refused to return to his place of work. The tribunal noted that he was working in a large warehouse, which typically included only five workers at the relevant time, and in respect of which the employer had already taken measures to limit the risk of exposure to COVID-19. The tribunal commented that it was not the case that the existence of COVID-19 in itself created circumstances of serious and imminent danger which cannot be averted regardless of uh, the safety precautions, which I'm sure will be a relief uh, to many employers. The tribunal was astute to the fact that relying on the relevant sections of the statute should not be used to allow a worker to refuse to work in any circumstances simply by virtue of there being a pandemic. Now, the outcome was that the claimant in this case was fairly dismissed as he couldn't establish his belief in a serious and imminent workplace danger. It was also noted that the evidence suggested that he didn't raise specific concerns about working conditions, but m more general concerns about the COVID um, pandemic and uh, his children's uh, health. In fact, despite these concerns, he'd driven a friend to hospital and spent a period of time working in a pub. Um, so he was unable to demonstrate a reasonable belief in serious and imminent workplace danger. So I guess a lesson to be learned in contrasting a case such as this with the veterinary practice one I mentioned earlier is that it tends to go down very well in an employment tribunal if an employer shows patience, engages with the employee and addresses their concerns with a careful procedure. Shooting from the hip will always put you on the back foot. Are you muted, Angie? <laughs> Thanks. Before um, I ask Julie to go through her case, um, we've had a question come in, so thank you for kicking us off, um, where a client um, had, or an employer had, an employee who took a week off and travelled to Bulgaria for a holiday when it was on the red list. Um, her employers told her not to go and that they expected her back after a week. She went anyway and didn't come back for six weeks. And they dismissed her for unauthorised absence, breaking... Um, UK law for travelling to a red list country for leisure and she is claiming race discrimination and unfair dismissal. Um, what are our thoughts? I actually ha had a very similar case to this where someone was planning on travelling to um, a red, I can't remember if it was red or orange but whichever it was it involved quarantine when they came back um, and 
we said, don't go. You haven't got enough holiday to cover. You, you need to have enough holiday to cover the, the time off and the quarantine period, which they didn't have. Um, and made it clear that if you do go and you're not back when you're supposed to be back at work, we will regard this as a disciplinary because we've told you specifically. Um, so uh, in that case, um, they didn't end up going. But had they gone, we undoubtedly would have dismissed them. And my thoughts are it would have been a fair dismissal. Um, obviously, it, it may depend on the evidence showing uh, that they did sort of warn them about it and that they knew that it would potentially be a disciplinary if they weren't able to come back on time. Um, but I think if, if you go away knowing that you can't possibly come back on the day you're supposed to, that is a conduct issue and they should carefully uh, word their defence to ensure that all possible um, grounds under the uh, ERA are covered in their defence. And I had a similar case where um, someone had requested annual leave um, several times for a religious holiday and was told that they couldn't go because I think he wanted nine weeks off work. He went anyway um, and that was found to be fair to dismiss yeah. him because um, yeah. he basically um, he went against a reasonable management instruction. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so that, 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 that will be relevant also, I think. Yeah, and you need. I think it's one of those cases we we've spoken about in previous webinars. Being careful what you put in the defence and the grounds, because you want to give yourself as many of those potential grounds for dismissal as possible. So, um, so yeah, no, in interesting that people still do these things. So, Julie, you had a very good win this year. Um, you represented in tribunal an employee who succeeded in her claims for discrimination and unfair dismissal. And the employer's conduct in that matter um, and sort of comments from the judgment are likely to provide a useful reminder to all employers. So can you tell us a bit about this case? Yes, yeah, so certainly. And you're right that whilst I acted for the employee, Think that there are a number of potential learning points here for employers so what was this case about well there were many strands to it but the underlying point is that the employee was disabled she suffers from epilepsy when she first started with the employer her epilepsy wasn't really an issue but then she started to need to change medication and she needed to take more time off because of epilepsy related matters now, the employer, on when she, when she came back from a particularly long time off sick, on sick leave, the employer called her into a meeting and they told her that they were not happy that she'd taken so much time off sick, that her colleagues were complaining that they were needing to cover her sick leave and also that the employee should show gratitude towards her colleagues. The Employment Tribunal ruled that this amounted to discrimination, in particular, harassment and discrimination arising from a disability. So what I would say to employers is that if you are faced with a similar situation, you have colleagues who are complaining about somebody taking time off, it's a case of explaining to those employees, those colleagues, look, you know, we recognise that you're covering this person's work, However, we do need to support somebody who is on genuine sick leave. With this employer as well, at the last appraisal, they told the employee that her bonus was going to be slashed. And the reason that they said it was being slashed was because of her sick leave. There were some other factors as well governing the bonus, but the sick leave was seen to be the main factor. The Employment Tribunal said that this amounted, again, to discrimination arising from a disability. So a lesson here is that if you do want to use sick leave as a factor to determine a bonus or other benefit, that may be OK. But do remember to discount from that any disability related leave. This employer didn't leave it there. They had a meeting with the employee 
they said it was a form of mediation whether it was or not is another matter but they use this as an opportunity to criticize the employee as was rather oddly for this employer they then said to the employee we want to hear about any concerns that you have and she let them know her concerns she set them out and she explained to them in writing that she had concerns about their disability discrimination actions and she said that she felt that this could allow her to bring employment tribunal claims although what she was hoping was that they would address the issues that she was raising now in response to that her employer did not investigate those complaints the employment tribunal was very critical of the employer for not doing so i suppose this again is a reminder that if you are faced with an employee who raises a complaint, maybe not in a conventional way, maybe not using your formal complaints procedure, but do ask the employee if he or she would like to raise, you know, be, have this investigated and do they want to raise it formally? I'd say there's nothing wrong in saying to the employee that you would require them then perhaps to go through your formal grievance process but certainly do not just ignore a complaint. This employer though, didn't just ignore her complaints. They sent her an email. It was a very lengthy email. And in that email, they told her that her complaints of discrimination were unfounded. They told her that as far as they were concerned, she'd raised these in bad faith and that they were now going to be commencing disciplinary action against her for raising these. They also said that if she were to bring an employment tribunal claim, then they'd come after her for their legal fees. The tribunal ruled that this email amounted to an act of victimization. So again, a reminder here that emails or words spoken in haste or annoyance can come back to bite you. Probably felt really good for that employer at the time to send that email, get it all off of their chest. But it was shown to be an act of victimization and that email has proved to be very costly to that business. The employer went on and did as they'd threatened and that was that they did commence disciplinary action against the employee disciplinary invite set out numerous allegations of misconduct. The employee wasn't well enough to attend that disciplinary hearing. So she submitted written representations with points about each of the allegations. And she said to the employer, if you've got any questions about this, let me know. The employer never asked her any questions. The outcome was that they dismissed her on grounds of gross misconduct and they dismissed her without notice. The tribunal ruled that the dismissal was unfair. They considered that there'd been an insufficient investigation and that the decision to dismiss was way outside of the band of reasonable responses of a reasonable employer. So just finally there, I'd say some points to note is that Probably here that employer felt that putting down lots of allegations against, against the employee, that maybe one or two of them were going to stick. But do be wary of that approach and only set out any genuine concerns um, in a disciplinary invite, because otherwise it can start to look as though it's a witch hunt against the employee. Also remember that if an employee does submit written representations or verbal representations, to take those into account. Do not just rely upon points that favour the employer. And sometimes you think that this would be obvious, but obviously not so um, in a number of instances. And it is essential to do a proper investigation, particularly when it's it may be the case that you would be ending somebody's employment. Thanks, Julie. So I'm going to talk about a recent Court of Appeal decision, um, which covers quite a practical topic and one which, be, which has been very relevant to employers recently. 
Um, in the past year, I'd say employers have had to consider redundancy more than at any time previously in history. And one of the questions which has come up time and time again is whether employees should be afforded a right of appeal when made redundant. Now, there's no absolute legal obligation to offer an appeal against dismissal in a redundancy situation. The starting point for employers may be to look at the ACAS code of practice on disciplinary and performance cases. Um, in which the ACAS code recommends that um, employers have an appeal process, but that doesn't apply to redundancy dismissals. That's not covered under that code. There is an ACAS guide on redundancy, which says it's good practice to offer an appeal, but in contrast to the official ACAS codes, it has no sort of legal status. Now, these discussions have come up with my own clients over the past year because more than ever before, they've needed to progress redundancy programmes quickly, efficiently, and very often the business doesn't have the time to devote to multiple appeals, especially when the uncertain and sort of devastating nature of the pandemic, especially in certain industries, has meant that it's very unlikely that holding an appeal would have changed the outcome. So it was interesting that we had um, a case this year uh, decided in September. Gwynedd Council and Barrett and Hughes came before the Court of Appeal. Judgment was handed down on the 2nd of September. And in short, it concluded that the absence of a right to appeal should not of itself make a dismissal unfair. But all the circumstances had to be looked at to see if overall not allowing a right of appeal um, was outside the band of reasonable responses, therefore rendering a dismissal, a redundancy dismissal unfair. So the facts of the case were that um, Gwynedd were, had a community secondary school and that school was closing down, but it was being replaced by a new school. Staff were told that they could apply to work at the new school and that if they were unsuccessful um, in getting jobs in the new school, they'd be made redundant. Now, most of the teachers were successful in getting a job in the new school, but Ms Barrett and Mr Hughes were not successful and they claimed unfair dismissal specifically on the basis that they hadn't been given the right to appeal their redundancy. Now, for some reason, they didn't argue that there wasn't, in fact, a redundancy situation. Uh, and the judge commented on that in the decision, saying it didn't really seem right that there was a new school that needed exactly the same jobs that they did. But they hadn't pleaded it and therefore it wasn't open to him to make any findings on that. The only reason for unfair dismissal could have been that they hadn't been given a, an appeal. Um, so... In giving the judgment, the tribunal judge said that only in truly exceptional circumstances could an employer refuse an employee the right to appeal a redundancy dismissal. And he found that they had been unfairly dismissed. The council appealed that decision um, initially to the Employment Appeal Tribunal um, who dismissed the appeal. So they then appealed to the Court of Appeal. Now, the Court of Appeal did agree that there was no general rule that truly exceptional circumstances were necessary to deny the right of appeal. But they went on to find that actually on the facts of this particular case, it was unfair of the council not to allow an appeal. And therefore, the teachers had been unfairly dismissed. The Court of Appeal made it clear, however, that it would be wrong to find a dismissal unfair following an otherwise fair process solely for lack of an appeal right. So this leaves the question of um, you know, whether employers should be offering an appeal open for employers. And what I'd say is if you find yourself in that situation uh, and if for some reason would prefer not to have an appeal right, speak to us because within the team over the past couple of years we've certainly looked at this closely with with some clients and you know we may have um some assistance that we can give you to help you sort of justify not giving an appeal right or sometimes what we've done is given a, a modified right of appeal so perhaps we might have li limited it to 
uh, where someone feels there's been bias, impropriety or some serious procedural flaws. Um, so yes, that's that's a case that I thought was quite practical uh, and of use to most, most employers and HR people out there. Now, one of the other big topics of the year um, has been the worker status cases. Um, Meredith's going to talk to us about these cases, aren't you, Meredith? Over to you. Indeed, yes. Well, this year has been an interesting one for workers' rights, despite the difficulties caused by COVID. And we've seen some interesting cases coming out of the appellate courts, applying what we call a purposive interpretation. And that is where the judiciary adopts a flexible approach to interpret legislation, to give it the meaning that um, Parliament intended. And that's been most visible in the Uber case. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this litigation. It's been in the headlines for several years now. Well, the litigation reached the end of the road, as it were, this year with a victory for the Uber drivers in the Supreme Court. And what we're going to look at is their decision briefly. Now, what do we mean by worker in this context? Essentially, we're all workers, but the legal context distinguishes between different types of individual, those employed under a contract of employment, self-employed people who are in business on their own account, and finally, an intermediate class of worker, and that's who we're concerned with today. They may appear self-employed, but they're not necessarily because they're part of a service or a profession carried on by someone else. The employment tribunal that originally heard the Uber case said that the claimants uh, were workers. The EAT and the Court of Appeal agreed on a majority and Uber then appealed to the Supreme Court. Now, why is this important? Well, workers in the broader sense of the word are entitled to the national minimum wage. They're entitled to holiday pay and they're also protected under whistleblowing legislation. That may well explain why Uber were so resistant to this finding because of the wide ranging consequences for them, particularly the inevitable administrative headache that can be uh, caused by having to calculate drivers holiday pay. So what the Lord resoundingly said was that you must and in fact uh, can look beyond the contract. Don't be fooled by what the contract says. And what they said is that this is a statutory uh, interpretation rather than a contractual one. So you need to go back to what we mean by uh, worker in the context of the, le of the uh, legislation. What Uber consistently maintained throughout this litigation is that um, the individuals weren't workers. That is, they said, look, all we are is a booking agent. The drivers are self-employed and they just use our platform to get work from us. Well, the court disagreed and in so doing, they explored various factors that showed that in fact, the Uber drivers uh, were subordinated and controlled by Uber. In other words, they weren't genuinely self-employed cabbies. Uh, they were workers within the Uber network. Some of the factors being relevant are the, the fact that the uh, drivers attend an interview. Um, they have certain, they have to meet some standards of performance. Um, they uh, Uber constantly look at the driver ratings because if you've ever taken an Uber, you can rate the driver. Feedback and so on can lead to them getting warnings and being blocked out of the app. So there's definitely an element of control there, which is one of the tests of worker status. Remuneration uh, paid to the drivers for their work is also fixed by Uber. So you can see there, it's very different to uh, pure self-employment. And then we get to the services agreement, the written agreement between the parties. And as I say, you can look beyond that at what's happening on the ground to determine the relationship. The services agreement that Uber, the model they have is that the drivers effectively are expected to operate through a limited company. Well, that's certainly the way the service agreement is set up. And the driver is then a customer of the, of the limited company. But hardly any drivers in reality were operating in that way. And also important in any uh, relationship like this is the relative bargaining power between the parties. Um, Uber sought to argue that they were free to do as they wished, but actually the drivers had no control over those contractual terms. And it was actually a condition of them um, joining the app and being part of the platform that they had to accept Uber's terms. They didn't have any negotiating power whatsoever. So taking all those factors together, it can be seen that the transportation service that was being performed by the drivers 
and offered to passengers through the Uber app was very tightly controlled. Another key tenet of worker status is the uh, requirement to undertake work personally. And if you have an unfettered power or ability to substitute someone for your own services, like a plumber might do, they might send along their friend if they can't make it that day, then there won't be a finding of worker status. So an unfettered right of substitution means that you cannot be found to be a worker. And this was looked at in the case of Stuart Delivery Limited. Now, this is a similar thing to Uber. Effectively, um, it's a technology platform which allows couriers uh, to deliver parcels to retailers and they use an app. Um, as in the Uber case, the court found a disparity here between the written terms and the other evidence as to how the contractual arrangements operated in practice. And it considered all of the facts and the realities of the system, including the written terms, in order to establish the entire and true nature of the agreement between the individual and the company. So the way the system works, um, the way that um, Stuart Delivery Limited operate their, their app, demonstrates very clearly that there is subordination of the individuals and control of how they, they operate. So the way it works is that the, the, the company release uh, slots, couriers are then expected to sign up for the slots. And once they have, they're committed to be in a certain area for 90% of the time uh, comprised within that slot. If they log off the app and they're not available for six minutes, or they refuse more than one delivery job within that slot, then they don't necessarily get the guaranteed level of pay. And they were getting less than a minimum wage as well. Now, a courier who's signed up for a slot can send a notice via the app to say they can't do it. So in essence, that's where the substitution argument comes in. Um, but what was notable in this case is that they don't have any power over who they send in their place. It's just up to one of the other courier drivers effectively to log on and say, I can take up the slot. If someone else can't take up the slot, then the original courier either has to fulfill it or is fined a penalty. So you can see there that that really isn't an unfettered right of substitution. And because of that, uh, the court found that the individuals were workers. The final decision I'm going to look at, which I found quite surprising actually, is one of Nursing and Midwifery Council in Somerville. Another key tenet of worker status, as well as the obligation to perform work personally, is something called mutuality of obligation. Now, this is more widely known in the employment context, but it's also relevant in the, the worker context as well. And that is if, uh, well, it starts with the employer or the putative employer having an obligation to provide work. Uh, once provided, the individual then has to uh, accept that work, carry out that work. Otherwise, there is no relevant mutuality. In the Somerville case, the question for the employment tribunal was whether the absence of a requirement to accept and perform a minimum amount of work for the council precluded a finding of worker status. Now, the council is a regulator of nurses and midwives in the United Kingdom. They maintain a pool of appointed people to sit as panel members um, in relation to regulatory matters and so on. And Mr. Somerville was on the panel for four years and claimed holiday pay on the basis that he was a worker. Now, interestingly, I, th I thought the Employment Tribunal found that he was a worker, even though the council, uh, the Wid Nursing and Midwifery Council, was not obliged to offer him a, min a minimum number of sitting dates. And he was also free to withdraw from a hearing at any time. Um, they argued, that is the council, that there should be an irreducible minimum obligation. In other words, that Mr. Somerville must have to fulfil a specific number of sitting dates in order for there to be a finding of worker status, for there to be sufficient mutuality. The EAT disagreed, um, and so the council appealed to the EAT. And the EAT also disagreed with the council. Now, ironically, in this case, um, the finding was that, well, in this case, the EAT did look uh, to the contract, and they found that there was something called an overarching agreement. There was an overarching agreement governing the relationship, and that each time Mr. Somerville sat on the panel, there was a contract between the parties. And that was sufficient to render there uh, being mutuality of obligation. So this illustrates really, again, that the courts will look at all of the circumstances when reaching its decision. And if you are operating a similar model to those examples given here, 
be prepared for the courts to analyze the true nature of the relationship. The contractual paperwork of itself is not going to be uh, determinative. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. So um, another question. So this is one that someone had sent in um, in advance um, and I'm going to ask Jonathan to give his thoughts on this. Are there any discriminatory issues around having a component of commission where employees with longer service receive more commission? Jonathan, can you answer that for our viewer? Well, the reality of the situation here is that if you if you do have a benefit which is dependent on longer service, there's a very good chance that it will discriminate indirectly against uh, younger employees. So it's uh, on the surface of it, it is going to be a discriminatory um, provision. However, when legislation was brought in by Parliament, um, it was thought that there were good reasons um, for using length of services as a, as a criterion, um, despite the fact that it disadvantages younger employees um, with ideas such as you know, encouraging um, commitment and loyalty um, to the firm. So as well as the general defence, there is a general defence uh, in indirect discrimination cases, as you're as I mentioned in, uh, earlier on, which is where it's a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. But that's quite a difficult uh, standard to, to, to reach for an employer in defending a case. So we wouldn't be in a position to recommend to people to rely just on, on that. But there are specific provisions. If it's five years or, or fewer, then um, it's it, it's not going to be un, un, unlawful because there is a specific um, statutory provision on that. If it's longer than five years, there's a slightly easier test for employers to use to justify uh, having having the criterion. Um, if, if if the employer reasonably uh, or if, if it reasonably appears to the employer that it fulfills a business need of the undertaking, for example, by encouraging loyalty or motivation or rewarding experience of some or all of the workers. So in, in those cases, it, it's it's going to be, um, is, it, 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 it is going to be fine. Uh, having said that, um, it, it's gonna be more hard work to justify it if it is over five years. It should also be remembered that potentially you could have a, an indirect sex discrimination issue as well because with things like career breaks, it may well be that the continuity of service of your female employees um, will mean that they're disadvantaged by such a provision. So that's a, an extra reason to be uh, careful about it, that those specific defenses applying to age discrimination don't apply to indirect sex discrimination. There you're going back to proportionate means of a legitimate aim. So it will depend on the facts of the case. It will depend on your justifications. It will depend on your workforce and its makeup. So it's definitely a case where um, come, coming to get some um, more advice on the particular circumstances is recommended. Thanks, Jonathan. Comprehensive answer there. Um, I'm going to speak about vaccines um, now because uh, a lot of employers are asking about vaccines. Can they ask their employees if they've been vaccinated? Can they insist that their employees have been vaccinated, uh, making it safer for um, you know, their workforces to come back to the workplace? And for care homes now, the situation is fairly simple. They can insist on staff being vaccinated or they simply can't continue to employ them in their position. But for all other employers looking to emulate this approach, uh, the position is a bit trickier. And employers um, are asking, you know, what can they do at the moment? So I thought it might be helpful to run through some of the issues. Now, if you're considering dismissing someone um, for refusing to be vaccinated, there are a number of initial factors to think about, and even those with less than two years service uh, could present a risk in certain circumstances. 
Now, employees may have various reasons to not want the vaccine, ranging from anti-vax beliefs to concerns over having it whilst pregnant, for example. In summary, the employer has to assess the objections given and think about them carefully. First of all, I'd recommend addressing in documented form why you want to implement a mandatory vaccination policy. Is it because of health and safety reasons and, and you're just trying to sort of adhere to your responsibilities to have a safe working environment as much as you are able to? Um, is it because of operational reasons or financial reasons? Are you worried about having a complete shutdown if a wave of infection strikes? How damaging would that be to your particular business? Can people work from home? Different workplaces are going to face different challenges. Some employee reasons are going to be more persuasive than others, and you'll need to consider each one on its own fact uh, and consider whether less invasive measures are available that would achieve the same aim. For example, regular testing, social distancing, mask wearing, ventilation, office partitioning, sanitizer, because for any employee faced with disciplinary action on the basis of refusing a vaccine, they'll be arguing that all of these steps should have been taken before insisting on vaccine. And the courts may well have some sympathy with these arguments. And for example, in the case of a pregnant employee, it, it won't necessarily be um, a defence to say, well, you know, the the government guidance is that it's absolutely safe because we can see from the uh, sort of scandal of the thalidomide scandal that those assurances were given many years ago and sometimes didn't turn out to be accurate. So I'm not sure that in certain cases um, you will be justified. Remember, the ultimate test will be whether the decision to dismiss was reasonable in all the circumstances. And this will differ from case to case, as I just said. And it goes without saying that if you are thinking of going down the dismissal route, you would need to go through a proper disciplinary process. It's likely that some claims will also be framed as discrimination, most likely indirect discrimination claims. Um, saying that the sort of requirement to vac be vaccinated disproportionately affects a certain category of person. Um, and I think the obvious areas here will be challenges linked to health concerns, which can uh, bring disability discrimination claims potentially. Uh, I can see there being sort of ethical um, belief type claims, anti-vax, ethical, vegan, philosophical beliefs, um, and possibly even um, race discrimination claims. Now, I haven't got time to go through the detail of each now, but I have considered all of them in more detail. And I have to say that I don't feel confident that many of them will succeed uh, in discrimination because if you sort of go through all the checklists, certainly on the statistics that exist at the moment, um, it doesn't give me confidence that, that any discrimination claims are likely to be successful, but it'll be interesting to watch that space. Um, if, if you're thinking you know, along these lines, then again, get in touch and we can talk through um, all of these sort of potential pitfall areas with you in more detail. We're going to have a look now at um, what's on the horizon. And um, Meredith, can I ask you, what, what are some of the hot topics that employers should be looking out for that are coming up in employment law? Well, it won't surprise you to learn that the most um pressing or, or the most apposite um, future um, thing is flexible working. We've all got really used to this now, um, working at home um, and all those reasons that employers would trot out for not allowing people to work from home seem to have um, evaporated and because we've all had to sort of get on with it, if you like. Um, and we've all become very used to working in a hybridised way. Um, and the government have actually now um, introduced a consultation um, it actually came out in September and it closes on the 1st of December called Making Flexible Working the Default. So that gives you a flavour of how maybe the future of the workplace is going to be, certainly for those that can work from home and in a hybridised way. And that's available on the, on the .gov website. Now reading from the consultation, um, the government have written, the pandemic 
has shifted the way we think about flexible working. COVID-19 required many of us to change how we work and employers have done a tremendous job in responding to this challenge, ensuring that many businesses which would otherwise have had to shut down have continued to operate. And at the height of the first lockdown in April, I think it was March actually, maybe April last year, 47% of the UK um, were working from home almost overnight and that compares with 11% in the previous year 2018. And while there's been a lot of attention to home working, the majority of workers, including most key workers, that option simply hasn't been available. So what flexible working, um, making flexible working the default consultation is about also um, is more um, balancing the needs of the employees and personal commitments for those who necessarily can't work from home. So reducing hours to accommodate childcare and elder care responsibilities, for example, looking after unwell family members. Um, so that they can still fulfil their responsibilities in the workplace if they have to physically go into work. Um, so it goes beyond simply tinkering with the flexible working regulations, which is one of the um, aspects of it. It's going to look at more broader flexibility. Um, and it also follows through uh, an earlier consultation, which was called the Good Work Plan Proposals to Support Families Consultation. So that, that's... Um, I think the main thing that we're going to see on the horizon, and it probably won't surprise many of you either. Thanks, Meredith. Um, continuing with what's on the horizon, and please don't switch off. I promise this will be brief, but I'm just going to mention GDPR um, because organisations should keep an eye on data protection going forward because there have been some changes and things are under review. Um, and most likely you'll need to consider some minor amendments to your current privacy notices. Um, so I'm going to do a whistle stop of the position. So the UK left the EU on the 31st of January 2020. And during the transition period, um, the UK continued to be treated for most purposes as if it was still an EU member state. From the end of the transition period, Section 3 of the European Union Withdrawal Act, uh, Withdrawal Agreement, converted the GDPR into retained EU law, i.e. European law that we've now retained for ourselves. Now, what's worse than one GDPR? Well, it's two GDPR. And that's right, there are now two GDPR. So we have UK GDPR and EU GDPR. Now, the UK GDPR will not necessarily automatically incorporate any changes that are made to the EU GDPR going forward, which we would instead need to specifically incorporate them. At present, the amended UK data protection legislation provides that data transfers from the UK to the EU can continue without any additional protections as um, the UK deem European countries, EU countries, to have an adequate level of data protection. Um, our government are going to keep this under review. Similarly, at present, there are no restrictions on data transfers from the EU to the UK, as on the 28th of June this year, the European Commission adopted adequacy decisions regarding the UK's data protection standards i.e. they said, yes, we're happy that the UK have adequate um, sort of data protection measures in place. Now, these decisions of the EU Commission um, have sunset clauses after four years, so they will be reviewed. So although not a lot has changed at the moment, um, it is likely that privacy notices will need updating to reflect some minor name changes. Um, Tactically, um, and this is the important bit, tactically, if I see an out-of-date reference in someone's contract or policy, it immediately makes me question how up-to-date their general knowledge is. It's surprising how often I still see reference to the 1998 Data Protection Act, even though it was superseded by the 2018 one, um, and even contracts that are out-of-date and refer to the wrong acts, even though we had sort of major changes to con contracts of employment that were required in April 2020, although I think with the pandemic it, it passed a lot of people by. So I'd say even though they're minor changes, make them because it makes you look good, it makes you look like you're on top of everything um, and a lot of your competitors won't be. 
Finally, on the what's coming up section, I promised you GDPR would be short. Julie's going to talk a bit about the sort of government plans regarding um, sort of sexual harassment measures. Can you tell us a bit more about that, Julie? Well, yes. So currently employers are legally responsible if an employee is sexually harassed at work by another employee and the employer has not taken all reasonable steps to prevent it happening. Under the government's proposals, employers will be required to take all reasonable steps to prevent the harassment in the first place. Now, it's not quite clear exactly what the government is envisaging will be needed, although a statutory code and guidance are promised and to be prepared. The other things, though, that the government is looking um, to do is to reintroduce protections from harassment by third parties and also to extend the amount of time that an employee has to bring a claim under the Equality Act. At the moment, it's three months less one day, and it's looking as though that would be extended to six months. Thanks, you, Julie. Angie. Uh, I'm on now. Um, so that's all we've got to, to cover today. We haven't had any more questions. Quickly put one in if, if you'd like to get in there. Um, and I'm really disappointed we haven't had any funny Christmas stories, but I'm sure have one of you, we've got three minutes left. I, I'm, I can't remember who it was that had a funny Christmas party story that we'd dealt with previously. No, I have one, but I can't probably talk about it on air. That's the problem. <laughs> um, yeah. Jonathan, did you have a funny one? Uh, mine, mine have been of the of the cruder, uh, the, the cruder uh, nature. I'm afraid, of crude in the sense of um, 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 of, of, of of ending up, uh, you know, in a serious serious punch up at the end of uh, of the evening. But the, the <laughs> most years that that seems to um, se se seems to come up. Um, but but um, I'm afraid the the one that uh, Meredith's had to censor is far more exciting. But. <laughs> We, we, we won't be able to talk about that. Isn't it interesting how these new sort of uh, online Christmas parties would lead to that kind of thing? But you can imagine you kind of breakout rooms and things like this. Yeah. Some comments being made. Yes. Well, thank you for, for watching our webinar today um, and indeed throughout the year because some of you have been regular viewers. Um, we haven't quite finalised our topics for next year and we'll be asking you for ideas, either put them in the chat box now if there's something you think I'd really like to go over this particular area, um, put them in the chat box, but we will do a follow up where we do sort of ask for some topics before we sort of set our agenda in stone. And then, of course, we'll publish that and invite you to sign up. Um, Hope you're able to have some time off over the festive season and that December isn't too busy a month for you. Um, but we look forward to seeing you all next year. And thanks again for watching. Thank you.